What if diplomats could commit crimes and face no consequences? In 2019, the world was shocked by the tragic case of Harry Dunn, a British teenager killed in a road accident. The suspect, Anne Sekulas, the wife of a US diplomat who fled to America claiming diplomatic immunity. This incident ignited a global debate. What is diplomatic immunity and why does it exist? Diplomatic immunity, a cornerstone of international relations, protects diplomats from prosecution under host country laws. It ensures diplomats can carry out their duties without fear of legal harassment or political retribution. It's a foundational concept in international relations, born from the idea that diplomats need to operate without fear of prosecution, even when they're in violation of the host country's laws. Diplomatic immunity traces its roots to ancient civilizations, from the envoys of Egypt to the heralds of Greece and Rome, messengers and representatives were given protection to ensure communication between states. They were considered inviolable. Any harm done to them was a direct affront to the sovereign they represented. The Peace of Callias, enacted in 449 BC, is one of the earliest examples of diplomatic immunity. The treaty, which concluded the Persian Wars, is believed to contain one of the first formal recognitions of diplomatic protections in recorded history. In the tumultuous period of the Persian Wars, the Athenians, Spartans and their allies were frequently in conflict with the Persian Empire. The Peace of Callias, named after the Athenian statesman who allegedly negotiated it, was intended to bring a lasting peace between Greece and Persia. The treaty not only stipulated peace terms but also contained provisions for the safe and unhindered passage of diplomatic envoys. Persians were allowed to send emissaries to the Greek city-states without fear of harm or obstruction illustrating the early understanding of diplomatic immunity's role in fostering peaceful interstate relations. During the Middle Ages, the concept of diplomatic immunity further evolved, and one of the notable examples came from the Italian city-states. In the complex and often dangerous political landscape of medieval Italy, the city-states such as Venice, Genoa and Florence were in constant negotiation and competition with each other, as well as the papal states and foreign kingdoms. Diplomatic envoys were crucial in these interactions, carrying proposals, threats and information between states. Recognising the importance of these envoys, the city-states developed a set of rules to protect them. These rules, known as legas legationis, were essentially a form of diplomatic immunity. They stipulated that envoys should be granted safe passage and should not be harmed, even in times of war. In the 14th century, the city-state of Florence was in conflict with the papal states. However, despite the conflict, the Florentine envoy was allowed to pass safely through hostile territories, ensuring that lines of communication remained open and facilitating negotiations that eventually led to a peaceful resolution. But it was the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations in 1961 that codified diplomatic immunity as we know it today. This international treaty, ratified by over 190 states, established rules for diplomatic relations between countries. The convention affirmed the principle of diplomatic immunity and laid out specifics, such as diplomats being exempt from criminal jurisdiction of the host country their residences being inviolable, and their correspondence being free from any interference. The convention emphasised that these privileges and immunities are not for the personal benefit of diplomats, but to ensure the efficient performance of their duties on behalf of their respective states. It also clearly stated that diplomats have a duty to respect the laws and regulations of the host state and not interfere in its internal affairs. In more recent times, diplomatic immunity has continued to have positive impact on interstate relations, including throughout the Cold War. During this tense period of ideological conflict, diplomatic immunity was vital in ensuring the safety and functioning of diplomats on both sides. It allowed for open communication channels between the two superpowers, the US and the USSR, even in the height of hostilities. It fostered the negotiation of several important agreements, including the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, which put limits on strategic nuclear weapons. Diplomatic immunity can also go beyond a legal privilege and transform into a shield for human rights. For example, during World War II, some diplomats used their diplomatic immunity to rescue Jews from the Holocaust. 
Raoul Wallenberg, a Swedish diplomat in Budapest, provided thousands of Jews with protective passports, saving them from deportation to concentration camps. More recently, in 2004, as democratic activists in Kyiv, Ukraine were about to be arrested by security forces, diplomats from the French Embassy, the European Commission, and the OSCE's Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights arrived on the scene. Under the protection of diplomatic immunity, the diplomats act as a deterrent to state violence simply by their presence. Unaccustomed to witnesses they couldn't intimidate, the security forces retreated. However, despite the Vienna Convention, the enforcement and interpretation of diplomatic immunity can vary. Countries have the discretion to waive immunity if they choose, and there's no global body to enforce these rules uniformly. In the realm of diplomatic immunity, there exist two compelling cases of violation and outrage, that of Juroji Makaretsi and Yvonne Fletcher. In 1997, Makaretsi, a Georgian diplomat in the US, caused a fatal car accident in Washington, DC. Initially, he invoked diplomatic immunity to evade prosecution. However, in response to public outcry, Georgia made an uncommon move and waived his immunity. Consequently, Makaretsi was prosecuted in the US served his sentence, and then transferred to a Georgian prison. This case challenged the traditional handling of grave crimes committed by diplomats, weighing the need for diplomatic immunity against the pursuit of justice. In contrast, the 1984 Fletcher case had a different conclusion. Officer Fletcher of the British police was killed by gunfire from the Libyan embassy in London during a protest. Despite the seriousness of the crime, the Libyan diplomats involved claimed diplomatic immunity, leading to their expulsion from the UK by but avoiding prosecution. This transpired under the rule of Muammar Gaddafi, whose tenure was marred by fraught relations with the West. Gaddafi's refusal to relinquish the culprit's immunity sparked a significant diplomatic dispute between the UK and Libya, and no conviction for Fletcher's murder has been achieved to date. Additional instances have also strained diplomatic immunity. The infamous Iran hostage crisis of 1979 to 1981 with 52 American diplomats and citizens held captive for four 144 days, flagrantly violated the Vienna Convention, leading to severed US-Iranian relations with enduring effects. In 2013, Devyani Kobragadi, an Indian diplomat in New York, was arrested for alleged visa fraud and underpaying her housekeeper, resulting in a significant diplomatic spat between India and the US. While the US maintained Kobragadi lacked immunity at the time of arrest, India disputed this, leading to reciprocal measures. While indispensable for international diplomacy, the principles of diplomatic community continue to invite global debate and scrutiny. Now let's imagine a world without diplomatic community because it would fundamentally alter the landscape of international diplomacy, posing serious challenges for the conduct of foreign relations. Firstly, the risk to diplomats would significantly increase. Without the shield of immunity, diplomats could be targeted for political reasons, caught up in the host country's internal disputes, or face unfair prosecution. This would especially be the case in volatile or authoritarian countries, where the rule of law might be weak or manipulated to serve local interests. The safety of diplomatic personnel could also be compromised, discouraging nations from sending their representatives to such regions. Consequently, this might lead to a breakdown in communication and reduce diplomatic representation worldwide. Secondly, the conduct of diplomacy itself could be severely hampered. Diplomatic communications could be intruded upon, and the impartial role of diplomats might be compromised if they constantly worry about legal repercussions. The fear of prosecution could stifle frank dialogue, making it harder to negotiate peace agreements, treaties, or resolve international disputes. Moreover, in cases of serious international tension, the absence of diplomatic immunity could escalate conflicts rather than diffuse them. For instance, in situations of war or political hostility, diplomats often act as crucial intermediaries. Without immunity, these diplomatic actors could be arrested or detained, causing a sharp rise in tensions or even triggering conflicts. Moreover, the absence of diplomatic immunity could expose diplomats to civil litigation, such as contractual disputes or personal injury claims. This could lead to a flood of litigation against diplomats, causing further strains on diplomatic relations. On the flip side, the absence of diplomatic immunity could provide a way to hold those accountable who abuse their diplomatic status to 
who commit serious crimes. However, considering the wider implications for international diplomacy, the potential benefits seem to be outweighed by the risks. Diplomatic immunity is a double-edged sword. On one hand, it safeguards diplomats from potential political persecution, allows for frank dialogue and peaceful negotiations. On the other hand, it can be misused to evade accountability for serious crimes, as seen in the tragic case of Harry Dunn. In Dunn's case, diplomatic immunity shielded Anne Sakulas from facing trial in the UK, sparking a diplomatic spat between the UK and US. The incident stirred a global conversation about the limits of diplomatic immunity and the need for justice. In response, the UK and US agreed in 2021 to amend the diplomatic immunity rules for US staff and the RAF Crowton base. However, the story didn't end there. As public pressure mounted, the British authorities formally requested Sakulas's extradition, but the US State Department refused, citing that such a move would set an extraordinarily troubling precedent. The stalemate led to a protracted legal battle that was closely watched by the international community. In 2022, a breakthrough came when Sakulas was charged by US authorities with causing death by dangerous driving, allowing her to be tried in her home country. This development brought a measure of closure to the Dunn family, although they continued to argue for Sakulas' return to the UK. The Don Sakulas case underscores the delicate balance that must be struck between ensuring the proper functioning of diplomatic missions and delivering justice for victims. It also highlights the complexities and frustrations that can arise when the shield of diplomatic immunity intersects with the quest for justice. The case represents a stark reminder that diplomatic immunity should not be a calm blanche for wrongdoing, but rather a tool to promote peace and mutual understanding between nations. In the global theatre of diplomacy, immunity is crucial. We must continually reassess how we can preserve its benefits while minimising its potential for misuse. After all, diplomacy is not about escaping justice, but fostering a world where justice is respected by all.